Hello, everybody. Welcome to Michael's Record Collection. I am very excited to have with me Royna Stolt from the Flower Kings. they got a new album coming out, Look At You Now on Inside Out Music. comes out here in the Uni United States. It's on September 8th. You also know him from Kaipa, Transatlantic, The Tangent, Car Mechanic, Agents Mercy, The Sea Within, and on and on and on. Royna, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, it's it's exciting to get new Flower Kings music. We went a few years without it. Now we're seeming to get it annually again. It's the 16th studio album from the Flower Kings following last year's By Royal Decree. And I can't wait to, to get into that a little bit with you. But first, I'm going to ask you what I ask all my guests, which is what was your first favorite record? Oh, Jesus, my first favorite record. Well, uh, truth is, I did I didn't own a record player until I was probably. I think we got the first record player uh, at the time the. The monkeys was the big thing, you know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about sixty six, right? Sixty five, mm -hmm. sixty six, probably sixty six. Um, but I had friends that had record players, and uh, I remember we used to listen to things like um, the Beatles' Revolver and Sgt. Pepper, you mm -hmm. know, that kind of thing. A little bit of the Rolling Stones, you know. Um, so, I mean, I, mean I, I really don't know. I, I don't remember, really. It, it, it Everything... I mean, looking back now, everything happened so fast back then, you know. So uh, one day you were listening to the monkeys and, and like three weeks later you listened to Frank Zapp and the mothers. That's <laughs> <laughs> quite a leap, you know. Sure. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like that's what happens. You have, I had uh, older friends, uh, guys that uh, had record collections and they were listening to the zombies. They were listening to Jeff Beck, you know, and uh, what else? Um also Rolling Stones, of course, and uh, everyone loved the Beatles. Yeah, and I think I loved the Beatles quite a bit myself. You know, yeah. My my big band, other, uh, other than the Beatles, were at the time Proclaim released their first single, uh, uh, mm -hmm. "A White Shade of Pale." Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, did you come from a, a musical family? How did you first get interested in, in learning to play music? Um, my mother played the piano and she played quite well. And her brother was a, a kind of a famous jazz musician, you know, piano player. Uh, so they had the music in their family and nothing really from my father's side, nothing I, I, I know of at least. Mm -hmm. he, he never talked <laughs> about any family members playing any instrument. But on my mother's side, and also I know there was, um, um, I, I think we still have them, violins, at least two violins. And it says Stradivarius inside, but they're not Stradivarius. No. We le I learned a bit about the violins, you know, because we think, oh, this, the, this, uh, they're really old. And, and uh, where did it come from? Something that came from my mother's mother and, you know, way back, you know, and... Uh, and they 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 still play, and uh, we just had to check it out. And I was I, I took some time, and I was checking up on those vinyl violins, and and it said Stradivarius. But then I learned that you know they're probably built in Italy. Someone someone brought them to Sweden, but there's lots of uh, violins that says Stradivarius that are not Stradivarius. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, yeah. So anyway, and and uh, Michael, my brother, who who's the bass player in, in the Flower Kings, he he started by playing violin actually, uh, and then went on to play bass. So he he still have them, but uh, for, uh, that's pretty much what I know. Of my family's uh, the the musical history of my family. But I mean, I my mother played piano. Uh, my my. My mother's brother was a jazz musician, and you know, so we had that. And then later, got of course, and we we, we listened to the radio all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The radio was, uh, um, it was playing. I think lots of Frank Sinatra, things like that. Um, Nat King Cole, some jazz music, some classical music. 
So I got got all that, you know. Yeah. And got then a wide variety the of background musically and 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 yeah. how did you how did you get started learning music? Did you ask for a guitar? Did your parents buy you one for No, actually actually um I think my my father got a guitar from my mother. She was hoping that he would probably start playing guitar but he never did. Mm. He was all into sports and stuff like that. So so he didn't really have an interest in in learning. Uh, he had a friend that tried to to you know learn a few a few chords and stuff like that, but he he just lost interest. So the guitar was hanging on the wall, and it did when I was a kid. And uh, I think uh, at some point I had a, a friend in school, and uh, uh, he sh showed me a few chords. And 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 at, at that time I started really started listening to to rock music and and um, the time uh, Jimi Hendrix uh, came onto the scene and bands like Procol Harum and later King Crimson and stuff like that. So, mm. um, and I had a few friends that played uh, guitar and and um, I just hang with these friends and they they wanted to start a band, you know, and I couldn't play an instrument. So I, I just had to learn something, you know, and I, I learned the guitar and later switched to bass actually. So I was in the very beginning, I was a bass player in a, when we started playing electric music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a set you get a good sense of of uh, learning harmonies and stuff like that when you play bass you know and uh, hearing the music in a different way because you can relate to the chords you can relate to the melody you can relate to the bass lines because the, the bass lines can change everything when you have a good bass player like Paul McCartney or Chris Squire is another one you know they can change the direction of the music with the bass yeah. playing for sure you were just what seventeen years old when you joined Kaipa? Uh, seventeen, yeah, yeah. How uh, what was that like for you joining uh joining that band and and um you know having some success with them? Yeah, I mean, it, it as I said, everything happened so fast at the time. So I I was in school. I I tried. I think I tried. I was probably like fifteen, and then I uh I remember that I I I was playing all the time, you know, and then we were playing in in bands, and I all my all my free time was spent just playing and rehearsing with the guys, and and uh, then I heard about the band in my hometown that were professional guys. They were they've been out playing, you know. They were a couple of years older than me, and mm -hmm. and I heard they 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 were a trio with just bass, drums, and keyboards. So I was thinking this this is probably my chance, and I bumped into one one of the guys, the drummer, at the gig, and uh, and he said they were maybe looking for a guitar player, and then I went home, and then I was thinking, well, should I call him? And I did, <laughs> and uh, he said, well, come down and 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 you can you know come down and jam a little bit with us and see where that goes, and and. And I got into Kaipa, you know that that took me into uh, the prof more like the professional world of world of um, um, touring and recording. Because in my wildest imagination, I would never think I could. I mean, just a couple of months earlier, I, I would never think I would ever record an album. You know, mm -hmm. that wasn't in the plan. It was I was just happy to to get a few gigs. You know, maybe I would get a few gigs in in my hometown, and and that would be great. That would be great to just go out and play. And then suddenly we were touring around in Sweden and, and we got a record deal, made a demo and got a record deal with uh, with Decca, actually. And, uh, you know, and off we went. And then uh, we did, did live, uh, live um, broadcasting, you know, uh, live shows on the radio. We, we did some TV and just kept on touring yeah. for about five years, you know, and uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that was a pretty good start for me, you know. Yeah, I would say so. Um, I'm always interested why um, a musician will, uh, you know, from around the world, different parts of the world, why they sing in English. Like, why not your native language? Was there a reason for that? When you uh, well, well, with my first band, we were actually singing um, 
the very first band we were singing in Swedish. So mm -hmm. I started writing lyrics in Swedish because that was our market. We well, we played in Finland. We played we played in in Denmark in Norway. Uh, we were about to go to England, but uh, then I actually jumped the ship because I, I got bored. We were, uh, I think we were just sort of standing still and we didn't, I couldn't see, really see the band uh, going anywhere, mm. really, <laughs> except going to England. But, mm. well, anyway, that, that um, I, I just felt it was my, you know, it was time to leave and try something different. And, uh, uh, and then I did lots of session work and I uh, produced some music with other artists and and then I started again and then I, I wanted to try to to write music in English to see where that would go you know mm -hmm. and uh, and when when I started the Flower Kings it was kind of I I I really didn't know if if there was a possibility to to sell any records outside of Sweden, you know. But I at least wanted to try, and and singing in Swedish was maybe not an option at that time, you know, mm. because I got to see the the genre in itself, you know. Progressive rock was at the time it felt like it was kind of small, it's like a niche thing, you know. Yeah, pretty much like jazz or 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 fusion that kind of thing um so i decided to to write a few songs in english and uh you know and it just took off from there you know and and within uh i suppose within a year we started to playing gigs in europe and then we got an offer to come to america and canada and and japan and and then it just you know went off from there you know and we did another album and another album and we did two double albums <laughs> stardust and flower power and it just went on yeah. like that you know crazy crazy yeah so you you mentioned you all you started it here with the yeah the, oh, you you got the that one that's yeah, it I that's the, it. i got the art collector's version this thing is it's beautiful yeah, yeah. get this it is uh, but um yeah really really nice packaging um, and so this great. one is is Royna Stolt, the Flower King, and then from there, the band became the Flower Kings. You you had a couple of different little lineup changes early on. Um, what what was the decision on your part to go from from Royna to the Flower Kings moving forward? Well, I I always I I never had any. Um, I really didn't want to be like a solo artist. And never it's, it's never like I I had a desire to to be the guy calling the shots or 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 uh, you know be the star of a band or something like that you know I I, I was uh, I was happy being just one of the guys in the band and I, if I if there was someone else standing in the front and I was standing in the back that that didn't bother me at all mm -hmm. really yeah and and also uh, I don't know it just felt right because the first album was called the flower king and the story behind behind the flower king is that we had a guy here in the 1700s that was called von Linné, a, a very famous guy here and and i don't know but he was kind of even even on a international level i think he was the guy that gave the the flowers names i don't know if you have any um uh connection to to Carl von Linné in America but it's I think it's it's a global thing you know he, he gave the gave the latin names for because he was traveling he was traveling to south america you know, and in america and and uh different places in the world and and you know just finding flowers and uh doing the systems of all you know the different species and and all that mm -hmm. so anyway so that was Carl von Linné and he was he was named the flower king he was kind of you know rubbing shoulders with the royals here and you know it's a, a very very well-known person he was from my hometown actually oh really yeah being from a, you, working in the university here and, um so so there's a good reason why we're called the flower kings <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah but anyway so um I mean, and and then we uh, we went out out as a band, and it's always been like that. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. from that point, you know. And yeah, so Hasse Freiberg was on the Flower King, this album, um, and uh, in 1994, and but he was not in the Flower Kings until Stardust We Are, although he sang a couple of songs on Retropolis. Was he yeah. reluctant to join the band, or had you been trying to get him and weren't able to until then? What what led you back to involving him in the band? Well, I think uh, if I remember right, there were the songs we were playing in the very beginning were probably more uh, instrumental oriented with a bit of singing, you know, and and so we we just tried to keep it down and we were just traveling in a in a van you know we the first time we went down in in uh in could have been 95 down to holland and germany and and uh, denmark etc we were just traveling in a van you know we had no roadies there was no sound guy no road manager was just like five guys in a van (laughs) and some some drums and some some amps and guitars and stuff like that so and we had already uh, uh, the, the fifth guy was a percussion player, Hasse Bruniusson, a friend of mine, and uh, mm-hmm. so we had um, he had this big uh, rig of of different percussion stuff, you know, electronic and and uh, acoustic percussion. So that was that was the idea to mm-hmm. to do the music like that, you know. And we had a great drummer. Uh, and it was myself and my brother and Thomas Bodin who was the keyboard player. So that's the way it started. Uh, but then I felt that I could concentrate a little bit more on guitar playing if I had another singer too. Okay. Because it was for me, it was kind of um, taxing to be singing and then playing all the rhythm guitar parts, all the lead parts, and try to recreate the music as it was on the albums yeah so that calls for for uh, maybe another instrument in the acoustic guitar sometimes you know and and even the vocal harmonies i think we could do because i think uh, from the get-go i had the idea that flower kings should not only be like uh, like a strong instrumental band you know with good players but also a band that could uh, deliver some vocal things live you know yeah so you just basically said it's time for me to to get more of the singing you know give that to someone else so i can concentrate yeah, yeah. and you already yeah. knew hasi so you just called him up and see if he wanted to be in the band oh yeah yeah sure 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 and i think the the thing is i think the first show we did was in canada we had the uh, two shows booked in quebec city and then uh the the gig after that was actually Prague Fest in Los Angeles. So I called him and I said, well, Hasse, uh, we have some gigs in, in North America. I said, uh, would you like to join the band? Uh, and he was silent for a while and I said, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I could tell he was interested, you know, but, and I said, there's, there's one thing you, you, you actually need to play guitar too. And then I said, no, 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 I can't, I can't do that. I'm not, I'm not a guitar player. <laughs> I said, I heard you play guitar. I know you can play guitar. Uh, and and whatever you do, you play whatever you think you're able to play. You know, it's not like you're gonna play any fusion stuff. You know. Mm-hmm. So um, so uh, in the end, he agreed. Okay, said, so, well, I try my best. You know. So we we went to play the, those shows in Quebec, and it was it was great because I mean the, he. We were kind of in shock, I think, because we went on stage to his first gig ever, you know, and there was these applause. There was a club, uh, probably like 350 people. But, but the noise from the applause was just crazy because even before we started the first song, we couldn't start the song because there was this loud noise from the people <laughs> clapping, standing up and clapping like like it was the end of the show. Yeah. And uh, clapping for an encore and just went on for 10 minutes. Wow. And I've never seen anything like that with any other band I, I've, I've played with. But there was just something. I think it's probably because it turned out to be at the time, this is 97, I think. And there wasn't too many progressive rock bands out there, you know. Genesis, they were playing pop. Uh, Gentle Giant was off the charts. 
um, other bands like UK were, you know, they were gone. Uh, yes, I don't know if Yes existed at the time, you know, or if they did, they were more like a pop group. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, King Crimson didn't exist. Emerson, Lake and Palmer, maybe, maybe I can't remember, but maybe not. So, um, and that meant that there wasn't much progressive rock. You know, yeah, it was very marginalized it, for a while, and it was it was bands like the Flower Kings and Spock's Beard that were yeah, exactly, exactly things alive. And and speaking of Spock's Beard, how how were you? Who first approached you about being in Transatlantic? Was it Mike? Was it Neil? Was it both of them? Um, the first person I met was actually Neil, and that was actually the same trip. We went to Canada for two shows, and then we went to uh to los angeles to play prog fest and we were playing prog fest and uh, um, spock's beard were was playing spock uh, spock's beard were playing prog fest and i i've seen the name spock's beard i never heard the, the the band but we were on stage and just about to start playing and i was fiddling around with my amp and there was this guy coming up to me behind my amp and he was this guy with long black hair <laughs> at the time neil actually did have long hair <laughs> yeah i remember <laughs> believe it or not <laughs> now and, and, and he started singing on one of my songs you know there is more to this world i think oh that guy must be on something you know i don't know <laughs> what did he smoke <laughs> But I said, "Hey, my name is Neil Morris, and I'm I'm in Spock's Beard, and and you know I've I've heard about them, and uh, and I said, hey, I, hey man, I love love your music, you know, and so we talked for a while, you know, and then uh, I think he contacted me via email or maybe fax at the time, um, uh, talking about Spock's Beard, and they wanted to go to Europe and play shows, and do you know any any promoters or do you know any?" places to do gigs etc mm-hmm. so i sent him uh, a few of, of these and so we we you know we kept in contact for a while and and then i think uh, just out of the blue i got a mail from mike portner you know saying uh, I'm, I'm putting together this band together with neil morse who you know and um, and he said uh i we had a mutual friend that had sent him something. I think Stardust We Are. Uh, mm. he, he sent that to to Mike, and he really said, "I really like you, your band, and and uh, we're looking to put together this prog rock band, you know. And uh, we have the bass player from Marillion, etc. Uh, do you uh, would you be interested in joining the band?" And I said, "Well, yeah, yeah. I'm, I this is what I do for a living. I I play music, so it's." Uh, I'm open to try something, you know, see if we can write some music, you know, and record. And you know, it just went from there. Yeah. It's been a it's been a great partnership for the four of you. What is it about progressive rock music that that leads to the formation of supergroups? It doesn't seem to happen quite as often in other genres. Ah, uh, we have the traveling Wilbur's. That's they, true. Not the progressive. It does happen. It does I'm just saying yeah. it happens a lot more in, in Prague, it seems like. Um yeah. speak- Speaking of these yeah. collaborations, you you got to do an album with John Anderson, uh, the Anderson yeah. Stolt album. How did that mm-hmm. come about? Where did you meet John, and and how did you uh, get together to to work on a record? Um, I think way back uh, there was some we had we had a mutual friend I think that sent me something at some point and. And uh, there was just a song, you know, a demo, and and um, and I played a little bit of guitar and uh, sent it back, and and uh, I can't remember. We just said, you know, let's see if we can develop it more, and 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 nothing happened really. And then it was, I mean, the Flower Kings took off, and and I was touring all the time, and I was, and my kids were small, you know, so there was life was really busy, but then. Uh, I think around 2000, oh my goodness, must have been 2012, maybe. Anyway, there was this cruise, mm. this uh, called Progressive Nation. Okay, yeah. And, and uh, we were playing with Transatlantic and we were playing with the Flower Kings. And in the end, they managed to get John Anderson to to play the boat also 
uh, doing his uh, solo show. He did at the time. He was sort of he got ill, so he couldn't he couldn't tour with Yes, you know. So he yeah, sort of he kicked out of the band, you know. And but uh, you know, he he played, started playing shows, uh, got better, and uh, bit by bit, and um, he started doing shows and telling stories and and played a little bit of guitar and keyboards, etc. So he did shows. So we were on the boat together, and then someone suggested that we we play uh, a few songs with him. You know, so we were okay. Well, let's try play long distance run around. Yeah, fine, fine. Uh, and we had recorded with Transatlantic and you and I, I think, as a cover song. Yeah, for them. So we, yeah, we can play that one. So we agree, agreed to do that, and that, yeah, that would be great. And it was supposed to be the 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 end of the the finale of the <laughs> the boat trip, yeah. <laughs> which was grand, of course. <laughs> but he ha he hadn't been singing with the band for for many many years you know because of his the problem with his voice mm -hmm. but anyway so we decided to do that and then um, i remember getting an email saying well uh, hey guys uh, i'm thinking shall we try to 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 play uh, side one of topographic oceans uh and 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 uh, Topographic Oceans happened to be one of my favorite Yes albums. I said, yeah, sure. Yeah, I know that. I heard that a million times. <laughs> I think the other guys in Transatlantic haven't even heard the album. <laughs> so, but, yeah, but okay, let's 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 learn that, you know. So we ended up playing almost an hour of, of music, uh, Yes music together. And of course, connected there and then kept in contact. And then I think the record label said something like... Uh, how do you feel about maybe making a record with John Anderson? Because maybe he's he's ready now, he's back, you know, he's doing shows and his voice getting better. And he hasn't done a, a he's kicked out of Yes and he hasn't done a progressive rock album in a long time, you know. So maybe that's a, a good idea, you know. And yeah. I said, yeah, sure. Yeah, that would be great. So, so record label contacted him, and I think uh, the same evening I got some songs <laughs> sent from John. <laughs> so yeah, so we, it just started from there, you know, when we were developing songs over time, and you know, um, it it took some time, you know, to to find all the bits and pieces and and how we could develop the songs and uh, because these were basically demos he had and I had to take them and chop them up a bit, you know, and mm -hmm. put in new ideas and, and uh, develop and send it back and, and uh, you know, gradually uh, sort of shaping this album to what it is. Yeah. And it came out great. Um, you guys did yeah. a good job on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2018, you released Manifesto of an Alchemist under the name Roin Stoltz. Uh, Roy Stoltz, the Flower King. So the first time since this one that we had both of those names on the front. Um, what um, can you walk me through those times? Was, was, what, did you think the Flower Kings were done? Did you think that that was um, a part of your past at that point? I don't know, really. Uh, it's it's just that if you play for a very long time with the same people uh, or with a band, and it just goes into uh, you know, almost working on autopilot, then uh, there will be a point where you start thinking, oh, what are we really doing? Are we doing this because it's fun? Are we doing it to make money? And I think we were as a band a bit scattered. Uh, I mean, emotionally uh, not on the same page, I think. Mm. So I just felt that maybe stop for a while and... Uh, and then I was again talking to the record label, and and they were asking, uh, "Is there any new music?" And I, I I told them how I felt about the Flower King situation, and they said, "Well, you can release an album in your own name." Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I I really don't remember how this came about. Someone suggested, you know, what if you call it like this? You know, people know know you and they know the flower kings it's not technically a flower kings album but you have some of the guys from the flower kings playing on it and some other people you know mm -hmm. so it was just uh and and at that point uh, i think uh if i remember right i had 
I think I had already done the See Within album together with Marco Miniman. So mm. I I think I just asked Marco, uh, would you like to play drums on this album? And said, yeah, sure. So, I mean, and we were, yeah, because we were actually playing a show with the Sea Within on uh, on the Lorelei Festival in, in Europe, in Germany. Okay. And so we were going to play that anyway. And so he came to Europe and we just... Uh, we had a like a venue where we set up the drums and and uh, a mobile recording for tracking his drums, which he did in in one day. I think, <laughs> to wow. be honest, I think, yeah, I was, uh, just crazy. I, I've never done anything like that before or seen anyone track that fast, you know. Mm. Uh, but he's an amazing drummer, and he really so is. I think, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we started uh, maybe around uh, ten or eleven setting up you know and i think by five we went to a late lunch and then uh, sitting out in the sun uh, down by the harbor and and then went back and he tracked a little bit more and and uh he realized oh so we, we we're done we've done the last song okay and then i think it was probably seven thirty, something like that <laughs> what can i say no problem and it's great <laughs> <laughs> Lots of great playing and great energy, and so yeah, so so that's how that came about, you know. And um, the label—I mean, for me personally, the the label doesn't really matter, you know. Yeah, you um, I mean, Marco's amazing. That's that's a great story. I I've only gotten to see him once, but you can't take your eyes off him when he's on the stage. He's he just is that good. You just end up watching him zeroing in on on his. Is drumming so um. yeah i mean it's it's uh, what i like about marco is is he has uh, very um he has his own sound he he um the kind of energy he put in is um it's nothing it's not for shows it's not like it's um he's uh I don't know how to put it in english but it's sometimes you see drummers and it's there's lots of show-offs and and uh, certain things you're supposed to do as a rock drummer he's not that kind of guy mm. he just put in that very naturally put in that energy um maybe a little bit like sometimes i can see similarities with uh, terry bosio you know terry bosio yeah mm -hmm. sure yeah so i can i can see the the same kind of energy i can see in marco you know and that is rare you, know? you have you have a few of them you know that it can be it can be heavy hitting it can be lots of technical stuff but but mark also is a, a great groove master he can play really simple things you know and when it calls for simple things mm. i think that's a good comparison uh, him and terry they do have that energy uh, at that same yeah, level. yeah um so look at you now is the new album it comes out uh, september 8th here in the us um on inside out the band as it stands now is my understanding Yourself, Roina Stolt, vocals, guitars, keyboards, percussion, and you produced the album. Uh, yeah. Hase Freuberg on uh, vocals, guitars, percussion. Um, your brother Michael on bass, uh, vocals, and guitar, and Mirko De Mayo on drums and percussion. And that's that's the band. But Lali Larson also played keyboards on this, and Hase Bruniansen uh, did percussion, and you had some backing vocals. Yeah, a um, couple of a uh, couple of female va backing vocals on this one. Yeah. yeah yeah true true i mean we, we we that's that's a starting point you know and then as you say we have uh we have two shows now in in september it's kind of a release party um um ho hometown uh festival flower kings festival two days full days so it's, it's gonna be big band with two keyboard player uh on stage and uh, Hasse Brunusson is going to be there. And we have a accordion friend uh, from, from Russia that's coming in. And and uh, I'm sure there's going to be more guests. And for the tour that we're doing in October, uh, it's Lale Larsson that plays the keyboards. Mm. So, uh, and then we'll see. We, we just keep it open for now, you know. And uh, it we had an American keyboard play, but... It's so expensive with all the flights and, and shipping the gear, keyboards and stuff. 
so it just turned out to be crazy i mean in the end it's like you can't rehearse really mm -hmm. um, and 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 bringing someone over and, and just to rehearse a couple of days you you have to pay like uh three or four thousand dollars you know we we simply can't afford that yeah that's it's a lot too complicated it's... then yeah yeah uh, travel from the u.s just even on a on a just personal travel from the u.s to europe is insanely expensive i know i know it's it's uh, big big changes you know and so it's not like um you you take something for granted whatever costs something like five years ago it could be almost double mm -hmm. now yeah for sure so it's it's uh i mean to to keep the band alive we need to find a solution that's closer to home you know and and I'm, i think now with because at one point we had we had sack in in california we had mirko in italy we had jonas in austria but now it's at least it's it's myself and Michael and Hasse in the same town, and now we play with Daniel Lance, and he's also in in the same town, and, and Lala Larsson is just in the south of Sweden, so that's about an hour flight from here, or by train, you know. Yeah. It's it's uh, more it's easier to handle that kind of situation yeah. for us. Yeah, easier yeah. Um, travel wise, easier on the wallet. <laughs> so. yeah. Totally, totally, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you you mentioned Jonas Reingold, you mentioned Thomas Bodine. Um, these guys were in the band for a long time. Uh, they're no longer in the band. Was was that part of what you're talking about in terms of it felt like everyone was scattered doing their own thing and 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 they were very very busy because Jonas has been working with a lot of people. Uh, Steve Hackett recently uh, yeah. doing a lot of other things. So I, I guess my question is is why those particular changes? Uh, I know those were. Those were guys who I've seen them in concert with Flower Kings a few times, and they're very well known to your fans. Oh yeah, to totally. And it's it's I think it's a bit of both. It's actually because they they're busy. I mean, Thomas is working as a teacher now in uh, about an hour north of here where we are living now, and so he's he's not in town, and he's uh, he has a daytime job, you know, mm -hmm. and also he had some some problem with his year i think at one point you know mm. and we all get older you know and and uh you know sometimes it's uh, you just uh the way uh the personalities develop you know sometimes it you you glue together and sometimes it's just like you're going different ways you know mm -hmm. and and uh, with jonas i think uh with him joining steve hackett made it difficult for us but we tried for a couple of years but now it just felt like after the covid and the way that the, the steve hackett touring is going we felt that we couldn't wait until december every time we're gonna tour because that's the only time he was free december yeah. july mm -hmm. and and as you can imagine that's that's not great months to tour <laughs> so we were we were left with just the the breadcrumbs you know and 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 um and Steve Hackett got the the rest of the year, and um, so so we just felt it was time, you know, to to part ways. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, it happens. So um, these uh, there's 13 songs on the record. Um, how do you choose which songs that you sing and which ones are better suited for other vocalists? I think that's something that comes natural. But usually it's just me and Hasse, you know, and we talk about it for some 10 minutes maybe and or, or over the phone or, or via email and, and uh, he can suggest something, I can suggest something, you know. I think that's that's probably suited for you. Sometimes we just try. He comes here to my studio and, and uh, he just try to sing parts and say, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that you could try that bit, you know. And and uh, and I say, well, I I did sing that, but I'm not sure my voice is suited for that part. Maybe you try and see if it works better for you. And maybe it does. Maybe it does not. We don't know, you know. But it, it's you got to try, and then you have to imagine what will it be like on stage, you know? Because on stage is is different than being here in the studio. Because uh, yeah, I mean it's just a different thing, you know. You play, you're playing, and you're singing for a whole night. It's like uh, you can push it in the studio, but you can't singing on on the on the top uh, mm. 
or two hours night after night is a, is, that's no. a little bit different no and and then and then also you have to figure out that Hasse have uh, songs to sing live and i have this uh, in a set list you know so it doesn't turn out to be just Reuner songs in a set list and Hasse singing one song or yeah lots of things to to take into consideration and and uh, but it's um i think it usually comes very naturally so we just talk about it and there's never any arguments about it we i think it everything falls into place nicely as it is okay you have um you're well known for your longer songs obviously throughout your career um was there an intentional choice made not to have a 20 minute song a 30 minute song on this record well, the truth is that, I mean, even even uh, if you look at other albums, yes, you have you you do have twenty minute songs. But if you really look at the songs, twenty minute songs, their their um, construction of different bits and pieces, you know, mm -hmm. that's something that we put together from not one idea, but from a couple of different ideas, and then maybe developed stretched out for a solo or, or a softer section or something like that whereas on this album we've sort of we never went that far we just took the song ideas and made them separate and then we put it together in the end and uh, you can view it as whatever 12 songs so you can view it as as a longer piece of music it really doesn't matter it, yeah. in my mind is not really a big difference it, it's probably what people see on the record sleeve you know they say oh they got 12 songs they got 10 songs why don't they have just three songs because <laughs> they're, they're the king of epics they should yeah. have and and then they think that the album is not progressive or whatever i don't yeah. know I, I i don't understand that kind of thinking because i to me i mean okay let's say do I always love the longer yes songs? Uh, yes, I like Topographic Oceans a lot, you know, but I, I love some short yes songs. And if you look at the Beatles, you have uh, the the White Album in a, in a way, but also Abbey Road that Abbey has Road. a sequence of songs, you know, and, and certain themes are coming back. Mm -hmm. Um so what what kind of songs do you like? Well, I I like the Golden Slumber. So I like uh, Polythene Pam or things like that. That's probably one and a half minutes. <laughs> yeah, I I don't care. I love the album, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and even Frank Zappa and the Mothers had short songs sometimes, and sometimes they stretch out. As Frank play, played like a twelve minute guitar solo. Yeah, it, it's not <laughs> like I always like Frank's whatever eighteen minute songs. No, I like the good songs. I don't care if they're two minutes or or twenty minutes. Sure, yeah, it's you're right. Somebody looks at the at the track list on the new album, they're not going to see what they would see on the back of Close to the Edge. You know, they're going to see a lot. Uh, more, e exactly, a Close lot to the Edge is a good, good example. You well, have a couple, but your album is longer. You you have a, you have more minutes worth of music on yours than than Close to the Edge has. True, <laughs> true, yeah. So. Uh, some of these songs date back pretty far. Um, I, I heard you say something about Beginner's Eyes, the first uh, song, the first single. Um, it originated in the early 1990s? True. True. That's something I wrote even before The Flower Kings was an idea or, or the idea of the first album, you know. Um, at the time, I was probably more in uh, the commercial side of... of record production you know and I've, I've been working with other people and producing other people and and sometimes just playing you know being a, a hired guitar player you know mm. on people's records and i was still writing songs and and it was a time when progressive rock wasn't uh, the big thing but i was i was still writing songs you know and this was just one one thing that i had and it's been lying around ever since and I never developed it, but uh, for this one, I found it. And listening back now on on some MP3 file I had lying around on a hard drive, I was thinking, oh, this, this is quite nice, you know. And uh, maybe I send it to the guys and see if they like it. And they did. And uh, so they said, well, that's that's a great theme, you know. We should develop that, you know. And, and uh, so I wrote some lyrics for it. 
and and then in the end when time came to decide the the, the running order of the album i think both michael and hasse said that that should be the opening track and possibly mirko too so they were they were in total agreement that yeah that's that's the right song to open the album with so it just happens that the the very first bit of music you hear is something i wrote even before the flower kings was an idea yeah it's uh, and for me, it's one of the highlights of the album. I think the guys were right. That was the that was the right yeah. track to open the the album with, <laughs> and I trusted them. <laughs> it's good. It's good yeah. job. Um, yeah. So you have um, you have the uh, the dream and Hollow Man comes in, and I was reading the lyrics to this one. I was curious, is this based on a person, a real person? Um. Uh, not one singular person. I think yeah. it's uh, it's it has bits and pieces of different living persons. Okay, <laughs> that we know of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Makes sense. Um. And you know the the thing that I took away from reading the lyrics is that this is I mean it's classic Flower Kings because it's all very it's all very positive. It's about sunshine. It's about love. It's about beauty. Um. It's about the earth. And and these are are topics that come back a lot in your writing, so obviously they're very important to you. Well, I think it's it's important to everyone, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> or it should be. It should be. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's you do what you do, and it's it's um, it would be uh, very difficult for me to just sit down and uh, decide to write about something that I really uh you know don't care about or 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 to construct something just because it's expected from someone else or from the record company or something like that or because other bands do or someone is more successful writing whatever death metal lyrics yeah maybe they are but that's not me you know i you gotta the starting point is always me what else can i do so so and then i suppose after a while of course you develop uh you know uh a certain talent for for the the, the very let's say the very typical roy nostalt lyric is you can probably find it in here you know but mm -hmm. hopefully i try to bit by bit develop and be a little bit more clever and looking back i i still actually like some of the because I, I, I mean, first of all, I, I did uh, re remixes and remaster of uh, pretty much all the Flower Kings catalog over the last one and a half year. Yeah, put uh, them out on vinyl. Yep, vinyl. So, so that that took me back, and uh, and I, I, uh, I had to listen to it again. And and there are of course bits and pieces that I'm not super happy with, but. Uh, I was surprised how well I reacted to to much of it, you know, both the music and lyrics. Actually, I was thinking it would be kind of cringe worthy in a way, you know, because you look back at something you wrote twenty years ago or twenty five years ago, and 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 it wasn't because I think it's um, some of the songs seem to stand the test of time in a surprise surprising way. For me, at least. Yeah. Um, so, were were there any lyrical themes that you had in your mind when you started writing for this album? Um, I mean, these days, normally, I it's not like I have big writing sessions where I sit down with pen and paper and stuff like that. It's more like I I put on the music and then I usually put up a microphone and start singing. Mm. That's the formula that worked for me the the last five or six years. You know, usually uh, get to a point where it feels more natural, rather than sitting with pen and paper and writing something, and then you're about to sing it and it doesn't feel right anyway. Yeah. So, so, so just, record recording it, and then you can go back a couple of days later and listen, and you you can instantly feel if it's good or if if not. You know, then you just you know move on to something else or. Re rewrite a few phrases and you know try to develop it that way yeah so it's very spontaneous for you it's more important to be spontaneous in the in your lyric writing well i just yeah i, I kind of trust the uh, you know intuition or i trust uh whatever you know 
sometimes in in life i i've learned to trust more intuition i think generally you you're there's something the subconscious is usually smarter than <laughs> than yourself or whatever yeah that's uh you know you learn something about yourself and you learn something about the world but uh it's um yeah i mean it it worked for me actually quite well you know and then you can go back and then you can always fix little things but yeah. but the basics of it uh, the bare bones of it i mean it could be something i i watch the news in the morning you know and then i get in here and and start writing music and maybe something comes up from from that or or something i read or something i saw on the internet or talk with a friend or something you know and uh, so it it uh, usually comes from uh, from real life in one way or another when did you guys start working on this record like specifically started sat down and said we're gonna we're gonna create a new record we're gonna put a new album out i think we started talking about it in november last year okay and then then i think we started looking for material and i was fixing up my demos and searching my hard drives and you know gathering the material and sending out and uh yeah, I think we uh, probably tracked the drums, the, the backgrounds, I think, uh, beginning. Because I remember it was snowing heavily in Sweden. And we went to this studio in the middle of Sweden. And, and uh, yeah, it was it was wintertime and, and cold, and but nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um... You got a couple of instrumentals on here, right in the middle of the the album. You have Doctor Ribido, um, mm -hmm. and then you have Mother Earth, and then after that, another instrumental, The Queen. Was there any particular thought behind sequencing it like that with the two instrumentals uh, surrounding uh, Mother Earth? Uh, I don't know really. I mean, usually it's like um, each and every member uh, make a list of of the preferred. Uh, running order you know and then you see if there's some correlation you know and and uh, if let's let's say for the for the opening track it seemed like Hass and michael and mirko had the, <laughs> the same song they wanted to start with you know and then what can i say you know uh, and they were probably right and um, and then i think we just talk about it there's never any argument you know uh I wanted to, I think I said I want to to finish the album with the, the longest song because it had some themes, sort of themes that comes back from earlier on in the album and it just felt like a, a good ending. Um, but the instrumentals, I mean, Dr. Ribido, that was something that Mirko sent me, some drumming that I put uh, some uh, guitar ideas on, on top of that and and uh, the other one, the um, so what's the other one? Not the Queen. No, there was the Queen is the, the second instrumental. Yeah. Oh, the Queen. Yeah, correct, yeah. correct. The Queen. Yeah, that, and that's an interesting one because there's an acoustic guitar, like a nylon acoustic guitar, in the beginning of that one, and that's that's an old friend of mine, uh, Jürgen, that was actually the guy who showed me the first guitar chords. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's kind of responsible for me and we had the band together but at that time he was he was like a classical trained guitar player already then and and then he became a doctor you know and uh, has in a, he's spent his time you know doing music as a hobby whereas i i took off you know and and <laughs> it became my daytime job you know but um anyway so he he showed me, um, I, my father had a guitar and, uh, when he came to my house and we were listening to records and he said, do you play your guitar? And I said, no, that's dad's guitar, you know. And I said, I, I can show you a few chords. So he showed me a few chords. And, uh, and I learned the chords and then he showed me a, a few more chords and suddenly we could play a little bit together, you know. And at the time, I suppose there was some Jimi Hendrix song or Jeff Beck or something like that, you know. And I, I remember King Crimson came along and we maybe learned to read from King Crimson and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were sharing the, um, the the musical tastes were kind of, we um, 
we learned from each other, you know. So he brought in a Fleetwood Mac album with Peter Green, you know, I listened to that, you know, and I maybe showed him Procol Harum and uh, we had other friends showing us Frank Zappa and the Mothers and <laughs> I brought in Santana, you know. So it's in that the way you do, but you don't have all the money in the world so you can't spend so much on records. So you, I bet I buy that one, you buy that one and we can, you can borrow albums, you know. Yeah, and we, yeah. And then we were playing along and, and and learning riffs from whatever Peter Green learning guitar licks and blues licks from him, you know. And so uh, yeah, that's the way it went. And the, the the interesting thing is, he's actually I asked him, can you play um, the acoustic guitar for this song, the Queen? Mm -hmm. So he did. He was hesitating, I think. First, I said, I ah, I don't play professionally, you know. I haven't really. He played a bit of Irish music uh, with a with a group of you know folk, Irish folk music, uh, more like a hobby thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, I I said well, take your time, take your time and and do it. I think it's a, a very nice book ending. You know, you showed me how to play guitar, and now you can play on our album. You know, and you know. Uh, it was I think, a lovely little story, I think. Yeah, that's a terrific story. That's I'm glad you told me that. That's great. Um, so "Day for Peace" is a song where it's got some some strong female vocals in this. And I'm curious as to when you when you're putting a song together, is it just that you hear that something's missing? This could use some female vocals, or do you go into the song knowing that you want to try something with with another singer? Um, how does that work for you? I think I, I think I sang the demo myself, and then the high vocal parts. I think I sang more like a falsetto, mm -hmm. and, and I think in the end I felt like maybe it shouldn't be falsetto. It's a bit distracting, you know. And then I could bring in Hasse to sing it because he has a higher range than than myself. So, but I was thinking that maybe given the content of the song and the lyrics and the feel of the song maybe we could bring in a female voice and i already knew marjana from because we had been touring with i am the morning mm -hmm. um, a couple of years back you know um so i knew her voice already and liked it and i thought that that would probably be a, a good idea you know so i asked her and uh, and she uh, agreed to do it and it just came out like this which i think is absolutely perfect it was meant to be like that i think <laughs> yeah it was a great call it was a, it was the perfect um, perfect person for the job and you're no stranger oh, no. you know you've you've used falsetto to great effect in the in the past on on songs like there's no such night on flower power for example uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so you know kudos to you for realizing that i don't think it's going to work here i think we need this and it and it turned out beautiful yeah so you end the uh, you end the album with the the epic. It's uh, just under twelve minutes, which is a is pretty short for a Flower Kings epic. Look at oh, you man. now, and uh, um, yeah, it, and you like you said, it brings back some of the themes from earlier in the in the record. Um, this is like if you're if you're looking at a track list, like as if it were a set list for a concert. This is the big showpiece that brings the curtain down. Yeah, a little bit like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, is this one of the last things you wrote for the album? One of the first things? Was it somewhere in the middle? Oh, I don't know, actually. Um, the, it's it's usually a, um, just like a pool of ideas. I mean, th this is a bit of what I had, you know, and then it's like they're just swirling around and people have uh, opinions and ideas, you know, maybe we do that one. You can try that one. Then I say, Oh, maybe I try to sing something else here. And maybe I, Oh, maybe I take away the drums. So maybe I put drums on that bit, you know? And mm. so it's, uh, it's developing over a couple of weeks, you know, and then we we'll see where it's going. And uh, so frankly, I don't know uh the specifics of of that song there was something that that was lying around and i think maybe bits of that one also is something i had from maybe five years or ten years ago and then some other bits are developed now i mean just a couple of months ago 
So uh, yeah, that's that's the way. I don't think much about it. It's like mm -hmm. it's it's bits and bits. Uh, it's music, you know, and yeah. when it comes, it doesn't matter to me. You're putting it together like a puzzle, then. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit like that. Yeah. Okay. Um. So when somebody buys this record and plays it start to finish, listens to it carefully, um, what do you hope they take away from that experience? I mean, first of all, I hope they, I mean, I'm sure there will be people that listen to it one time and they love it, but I'm, I'm sure also there will be lots of people that listen to it one time and they say, well, they, they, they play well, you know, I don't know if the songs are there. I don't know if I like the songs yet <laughs> listen maybe listen two times or five times or ten times i think the coin will drop it's that kind of an album mm -hmm. probably on the surface probably seem not super impressive because they're not super super impressive uh, tricky parts really on it it's um it's kind of um song based it's um it's not flashy playing it's not like fusion or that kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, but i think um like a lot of the music that i've grown up with, because i listen to lots of i love fusion i love i mean i love the shikoria the band he had in the 70s you know weather report herbie hancock mm -hmm. alan holsworth all those guys uh, but I also loved lots of, of great, uh, well-crafted pop music, you know, like Jackson Brown, like ABBA, like the Beatles, of course, even some Bob Dylan and some of the British pop groups, you know, from the 60s. So that's something I've, I've been growing up with. And of course, classical music. So, so and uh, and with classical music, yes, I, I love Stravinsky, but I also love very simple and melodic classical music. Um, so uh, in my world, uh, a good a good Flower Kings album can be tricky, but it might as well be something that is leaning more towards the the poppy side of or. There's not much riffing. We had uh, on some other albums, we, we tried a little bit of more metal, but there's so many bands out there now. So I, I can't really keep track of all, all the bands, you know, they're, they're, they're riffing away in, you know, in odd time. And it's, it's just like crazy and it's very intense. And I think the, the scene is kind of saturated with those type of bands, you know. So I felt that the Flower Kings should do something that, we do well and something that not many other bands are doing you know and that's well crafted melodic music you know with with uh, traces of of uh, classical music uh, folk music uh, swedish folk music and uh, pop music well said with a, with a symphonic touch i, I might add because yeah. that's <laughs> it's always yeah, always, always that. Um, Royna, thank you so much for that. That's that's uh, that's great. I know you guys are going on the road this fall in Europe. Will there be any chance of you coming over to this side of the pond and doing some shows or some festivals at least over here? Um, well, we're we're hoping we can because I mean we're uh, one thing is for sure, and that's we're doing the cruise to the edge mm -hmm. again. Uh, and that's, I think, if I remember right, maybe February or early March, maybe. Can't remember now. But so we're doing that. And and um, the idea is to possibly do a couple of shows in America, maybe in Canada. That'd be at great. That time. Because we're, anyway, if we travel across the pond, we might as well play in American, American soil, I think. Yeah. Well, I've gotten to see you a couple of times over in the Tampa area. So it's at least I've I've been able to see you guys live a couple of times, and uh, you never never take it for granted because uh, I know how difficult it is, and how difficult our country makes it for for yeah, musicians yeah. from Europe to come here and and you know make any money. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. All right. The album is called "Look at You Now" on Inside Out Music. Comes out September eighth here in the U.S. Visit RoynaStolt dot com for all things Roina and the Flower Kings. Rena Stolt, thank you so much for your time, sir. It's been great uh, talking to you, learning a little bit about this record and, and a lot about your past. I really appreciate it. Lovely.